Hi, and welcome to uh, Lit Up X episode five. This one is called Getting Personal. We're so excited that you are here today. I'm Julie Corlett from the Southern California News Group. Julie, hold on. I don't think you hit broadcast. Oh, I didn't. No. Oh. Okay, because I don't see any attendees. Yeah. Uh, okay. okay, let's try that again. Cool. Yeah, broadcast. I thought I must have hit the, I didn't hit the button. Okay. Here we go. Welcome. This is Julie Corlett from the Southern California News Group, and you are here to uh, be part of our Lit Up Episode 5, which is entitled Getting Personal. Thank you for coming today. Um, before we get started, we have just a couple housekeeping um, things to note. Our attendees are muted, and that's just so that there will be free flow between the interviewer and the interviewees. We are um, have the chat and the Q&A open, and we have people monitoring that. So feel free to use those features. They're on your toolbar. We are also videotaping this session, and those who have registered will um, be getting the link for the video as well. We will also be hosting them on the Southern California News Group uh, YouTube channel. Anyway, as we get going, um, I want to uh, start off by introducing Samantha Dunn. She, in her own right, is an author of several books. She's an award-winning journalist, and she's currently the editor of our specialty publications here at Southern California News Group. Welcome. Thank you, Julie. It's nice to see you again this week. Well, this is becoming a habit, isn't it? It is, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you guys, I have to apologize to you right off the bat. For some reason, my cat has now decided to lose her mind. So if you hear like screaming in the background, it's not anything. I'm not killing anyone. It's just my cat. Anyway, um, welcome to our valued subscribers and, and to our audience. We appreciate your support and we couldn't do this without you. Um, again, this is our sixth uh, episode in the series Lit Up, uh, our summer reading series, and it is my pleasure to um, introduce our hostess with the mostess, a dear friend of mine. Variety once named her, I haven't said this yet, Variety once named her one of the 50 most influential comedians in America. She's an NPR commentator and author of six books, including Mad Woman and the Roomba, which I am loving right now. Um, my friend and yours, Sandra Singlo. Hello, Sandra. Hello, Samantha Dunn, this Friday. Oh, I got it. Um, this week's theme is getting personal. And of course, when you're first getting to know someone, like one of the first questions is, where are you from? So where are you from, pal? Oh, you're asking me. Oh, well, all right. Well, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm from Malibu, California, but wait not the rich part of Malibu, the poor of Malibu. There were the poor. The poor. Because in the 60s, you must, uh, my Shanghainese engineer father worked at Hughes Research, and my German mother was, in fact, a 1960s housefrau. So my Malibu growing up was not a glamorous place. It was a terrifying beach town with blinding sun and palm trees and six feet tall blonde kids that were gorgeous and skateboarding and wearing those puka shell necklaces made popular by David Cassidy of the Partridge family. Oh, I still so remember David Cassidy. Oh my God. This is the perfect setting for a nerd favoring black outfits to start reading at <laughs> six and eight and the bookmobile so that makes a reader and how about you samantha where oh well, my dear yeah. my dear i am from a trailer park in northern new mexico but wait then i went to australia and my friends used to say only a kid from a trailer park would think moving to a penal colony is a step up but anyway <laughs> uh and <laughs> then i went to france and worked for a french heavy metal magazine a false bonjour and then I ended up following a musician to LA, which I thought was just gonna be for a few months. And now here we are, Sandra. A few, a couple of years later. A couple so, of years. I, I think what's, what's kind of great about our little stories is that here we're doing Lit Up, which is a summer book and writer series. And it seems like kind of, we can be one of two things. I'm like both Chinese and German. I'm both a valley girl, but also a semi-intellectual here. Uh, so, and you have, you have your duality of how you grew up also, of kind of like throwing in New Mexico, your prom was a Paris themed prom. Like, so I think that we're gonna see today in some of the stories and the writers of people holding many dualities, 
many different identities Absolutely. of race, class, story, style. And so that's why we're going to be getting personal today. Yes. And it's, it's, a, it's a lot to cover, but I will tell you it's 100% soul. So I'm looking forward to tonight. Great. And with that, as with the great British baking show, bye-bye. We'll see you at the end. Bye-bye. Okay. So our first guest is Susan Strait. And here is the 30-second download on Susan Strait, if you are new to her work. Susan Strait's short stories and essays have appeared in a range of publications, and I do mean a range. Consider this. The New Yorker, New York Times, LA Times, The Guardian, Alta, The Believer, McSweeney's, Zoetrope, Reader's Digest, Real Simple, and Family Circle. I do, love, I do love the recipes, I gotta say. She's published eight novels and two books for children, for which she's been awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship, among many other awards. Her newest book is a memoir titled In the Country of Women, and to give you a flavor, it's based on women's stories told for five generations to straight and her daughters in driveways and trucks, at parks and funerals, all in California. A Barnes and Noble pick, for uh, August, I believe, and you can correct me on the wording of that, the paperback comes out in August, so be sure to pre-order. Susan was born in Riverside, still lives there with her family, been writing about Southern California and the inland area for 40 years. Talk about a native daughter. Welcome, Susan. Hey, this is pretty fun. I'm so yeah. excited. And I'm, I was so happy to see all the newspapers scrolling across the bottom because I used to write for the Press Enterprise when I was 19. And my dad lived in Pomona, so Inland Valley Bulletin. I grew up reading the San Bernardino Sun. And I loved the Los Angeles Daily News when I lived in LA. So this is really thrilling. Orange County Register, also always we just wanted to be in there for baseball scores, right? <laughs> Yay, and that's what we're doing here today. Those are the subscribers that are here today. So Riverside and the Inland Empire, I mean, for those who just consider Riverside someplace to drive through, what, what could you tell them if they're new to Riverside What's unique about it and what fascinates you? Well, about what you just said about duality is fascinating because part of the thing that whenever, when I've driven um, to LA, people always ask me about Riverside, but I also drive across the entire nation every summer with my dog. I leave Riverside and I go all the way to Eastern Canada to Prince Edward Island, land of Anne of Green Gables, because that's where my stepdad is from. But also having traveled the entire country and the world for books, people are fascinated by how many mixed race people live in Riverside. So I grew up in a place that's surrounded by military bases. You've got Nor uh, March Air Force Base, Norton in San Bernardino, and George, you've got Camp Pendleton and 29 Palms, these are all around us. So for example, um, I met my future husband in the eighth grade, but we didn't really get to know each other until, well, we took a field trip to the LA County Zoo and this was a freshman year of high school and our high school got kicked out of the zoo for torturing the animals and so Dwayne was sitting in the very back seat of the bus and I was in the second to last seat and then he tapped me on the shoulder and said oh I think I know you and then that's how we got together however on the basketball team during those years and the subsequent years um, our star point guard Georgie Smith's mom had been born in Kyoto Japan and his her, his dad was an African-American serviceman from Texas. Uh, Richard Box, our other star, his mom was German and his dad was black. So everything about Riverside has always been this way. And I didn't know it was any other way until I went out into the world. And that's really what my memoir is about is that everyone migrated here, whether it was post-slavery. Um, Dwayne's great grandmother, Fine, uh, was born just after emancipation and ended up leaving uh, Tennessee, going to Texas, then they went to Tulsa, then they went to um, uh, back to Texas, His and ended up in Calexico. His mother's side of the family left Sunflower County, Mississippi after um, his great-grandmother was murdered and her cousin was lynched. And they ended up going on a cross-country odyssey. My mom, it's funny because I, I realize I have Heidi here, my mom was born in the Swiss Alps, like Heidi land. But my mom's favorite story was Oh, Heidi, that was a fun story compared to my childhood. <laughs> when she read it to me, I was like, wait, this is a terrible story. And my mom's like, my story was much worse. <laughs> so speaking of women and their stories, what sparked this book? What, what, what was the spark for this particular memoir? You know, 
the spark for this book was this tiny fragment of a photo that I actually have this photo right here. This, this beautiful picture of my mother-in-law, this is Alberta, and this is her sister Rosie, and they look like Supremes, don't they? They're just gorgeous. And we were going through um, photos, and I found this, it's a fragment of a photo, so it's really, it's this big, and it was in a baggie, and it had a piece of cardboard to keep it safe. And my mother-in-law died in 1995, in February, and I was pregnant with my youngest child, Rosette. And so my youngest kid never got to see her grandmother. And she's the one that looks the most like her. She has these same beautiful winged eyebrows. She has a dimple in the same space. Her hips are set the same way. So all of my uh, youngest, I have three daughters. They're on the cover of the book. All of my youngest daughter's life, I would tell her about her grandmother. But it was in 2011 when I found this fragment of a photo and I thought, you know, this is a tiny little photo, and yet there's this huge history behind it, and that seemed to represent everything about women's history. Right, Sandra? Like, women tell each other all the real stories, like in the kitchen, or in the front seat of the truck while you're waiting for someone, or in the driveway, and that's literally what this book became, is that all these women had made these really heroic Homeric odysseys, like my mom and her stepmother, her mean stepmother, came all the way from Switzerland, and my real grandmother, my grandfather killed her in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. But at one point, she lived right next to Angela's temple and she went to service there. So they all told me these stories and yet no one had written them down, which is I think common for women's stories. Can you dig into that just a little bit further of how men's stories will tell will tend to get told and we sort of know on the big sweep of things there are wars politicians generally etc cetera, etc cetera. but is it do you think also in families the men's stories get told more or in a different setting well which is fascinating because except for my in-laws family the women were so strong and their stories were so strong that that's when i realized how lucky i was and that because also i have three daughters I wanted to make sure that they had, they'd heard these stories in the driveway about Aunt Jenny who killed a man and you know, when she was 17 and then you know, ended up making her way to 22nd and she had a house at 21st and Central in Los Angeles, right next to the Ice House on Central Avenue. And she raised all her half sister's children. She never had children of her own. She'd been um, violently attacked so many times. My kids knew those stories, but I wanted the rest of the world to know them. And because we were sort of a matriarchal family on my in-laws side, all the, the big giant uncles, like Uncle Bobby was the first black um, sheriff's deputy and Uncle Stan was the first black lead engineer for the Department of Water and Power. And you know what they always talk to me about? Their mother and their grandmother. And so for me, it was a matter of, it took five years to sort of use ancestry to find people's addresses and to try to find the first woman who was fine that was the woman whose mother was enslaved in tennessee and it took me five years to find her and when i found her i was able to go back to the uncles two of whom are still alive and say look here's her name in a census document and they cried i figure some of us are like that like that's what we do um as you said we're we're readers and writers and book nerds but also Think about all the wagon trains, you know, who did the laundry? <laughs> like, it's not like there were no women on the wagon trains. And like, if you look at the way war history is told, it is as if the only battle is on the battlefield when we all know the battlefields at home um, were just as hard. And the depression, people talk about the Great Depression and you see these bread lines and you don't see the pictures of the kitchens where women were saving, as you know, from our grandparents, rubber bands and foil and so I'm, I'm obsessed with the way women are these anchors, but that they don't get the Homeric Odyssey. They get something that's much more domestic. And I think that we should not relegate women to the domestic, not at all. Right, the Homeric Odyssey of going away while the, the wife is home knitting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, and then I think that's fascinating to kind of turn the narrative. And you said that so beautifully that they don't get the heroine's journey. Um, so yeah, women, uh, they crossed the they crossed the country fleeing men like all the women in these stories 
were, came by themselves to California. They did not come accompanied by men. They came because a man had threatened to kill them or had pointed a gun at them or had abandoned them. And they showed up here by themselves with all these kids. And I always thought, now that's really something. In the 30s, they came. Um, that was really a big story. So of the many um, awards that this book has gotten, it was long listed for the Carnegie Medal for Excellence, which you said you cared about a lot because you said libraries saved your life. <laughs> they did. When I started trying to figure out, as you know how hard memoir is, this is my first one, and girl, you're a veteran, like you're a veterana at this. It's trying to figure out how to frame it. And I walked around forever and I remembered that bookmobile that you just said. I remembered being, the first, the first thing is, I had to ask my mom. My mom is, is 85, and she's a very tiny woman. She's four foot 11. Um, she used to claim she was five feet, but there were five of us in the family. And one time we caught her and put her against the wall and measured her, and we're like, you're four 11. Like that made a difference. Um, my mom now is telling stories that she would never have told me in the past. And so I always asked her how I learned to read. And she said, I taught you to read in one weekend when you were three years old because your father had left. My real dad had abandoned us. And my mom was eight months pregnant with my brother. And the first story was, I taught you to read so you'd shut up and go to the babysitter and not get hit. And I was like, okay, plausible. The second story was, I taught you to read in one weekend because I thought you had to know how to read to get into American kindergarten. And I was like, also plausible because I went to kindergarten when I was four because she was like super happy just go down the street and don't come back. But she told me the truth two years ago as I'm finishing this memoir. She said, I took my last quarter. We were so poor. She didn't have a, even have a, she wasn't a citizen. We lived in Rubido. And she said, I took my last quarter and you kept begging for a book and you were three years old. And I bought you a little golden book at the Stater Brothers on Mission Avenue. And you read it once and you knew it. You, you knew the whole book. And she said, then you wanted another one the next day and I had no money and we were eating oatmeal. She said, so I had to take you to the library. And that's the, what I mean is, I literally mean the library saved my life because she said we were out of food and there was no money for books. So I, I read at the library, uh, I was the oldest of five kids by the time I was five, my mom had remarried and then we also had foster kids. And I would check out 20 books a week in that classic, you know, Francie, Tree Grows in Brooklyn, um, yeah, so the library did save my life. It really, really did. And having the Riverside Public Library um, come in the book form of the bookmobile when I was nine meant that I could go walk to that bookmobile and by myself. I crossed over railroad tracks, went through a giant drainage ditch, climbed two chain link fences, and ended up in the Alphabet parking lot for two hours. And, it, and then I read Alfred Hitchcock and J Joyce Carol Oates' terror stories. <laughs> I was like nine. <laughs> And one final question, it's so fascinating. I mean, you've written, you've explored the stories of white women and explored the stories of black women and you have three biracial daughters. Is there a hope that you have for them in terms of navigating all these questions of race and identity going forward since they are, you know, is there hope that you have for them of reading this book or reading other kinds of literature that can pave the way for young people? Well. I wrote a children's book back in 95 that um, featured biracial kids. It was called Berry Bear. And it was, it was really early for the time. And people still love that. I actually gave it to one of my neighbors and she wrote me a thank you card because her kids are biracial. I mean, I still live right down the street from where I was born. I'm surrounded by hundreds of relatives. And like, I have nephews who are married to um, young women whose families are from Ensenada or from Cabo San Lucas. Um, I have a nephew who is Samoan, Irish, Mexican, and Black, and his girlfriend is white. I have a son-in-law who is from Ibadan, Nigeria. My middle daughter's married to Kumi. Um, and my older daughter's partner is a white guy named Andre LeBlanc, which is literally Andre the White. <laughs> and he's a Cajun guy from Louisiana. So our family, I think, represents what California is. And so we've always been ahead of the curve in that. People uh, often ask me about my girls. And of course, like many biracial kids, my girls could say that they're in the middle. But the truth is America, of course, sees them as young black women. And that is how they live their lives. But also that truth is that they grew up in a place where their best friend was you know, Hawaiian and black and their other best friend was Irish and Mexican. So 
until they left this place. They hadn't thought about it as much as they have to now where they are in Texas, Northern California and LA. Of course they have hope. We have to have hope or we wouldn't get up in the morning, right? That's a, thank you and what a great place to end. Thank you, Susan Strait for joining us. Look for her book uh, in the country of women named the best book of the year by NPR Coats, which end real simple in paperback this August. Okay. Next up, we have the wonderful Luis Alfaro and his 30 second download. It could be longer as usual, but here we go. A Chicano born and raised in LA's Pico Union District downtown, Alfaro is a re recipient of a MacArthur Genius Grant and is the first playwright in residence in the 85 year history of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. In 2017, Oedipus El Rey, a New York Times critic's pick, enjoyed a sold out run at the Public Theater. I believe it was extended three times. He returned with his critically acclaimed Mahada, a Medea in Los Angeles. Other noted plays include Bitter Homes and Gardens, Pico Union, Downtown, Cuerpo Politizado, Straight as a Line, Breakfast, Lunch, and Dinner, No Holds Barrio, and Black Butterfly, many of which have always been, also been published in or as stories or as poetry. His brilliant one-man show, St. Jude, details the complicated relationship between Paul Faro and his father. He's an associate professor in the MFA Dramatic Writing Program at USC, and he has a new book out in September from Methuen, the Greek Trilogy, of Luis Alfaro. Welcome, Luis. So good to be here. Thank you for having me, my old friend. <laughs> it's so great to see you. And we were noting that we probably met in the 80s. I saw you at a reading at Skylight Books, in, and it was fantastic. And I thought, who is that guy? And well, we were both part of the performance art scene. So I see a lot of your performances in the 80s and 90s, early 90s. Yeah. Yes, and I remember before we, we pivot to the other work, I have an image of you in roller skates and I believe a black negligee in highways eating Twinkies and the whole audience is mesmerized and these were the performance art days and, you, and I believe you were a poet when we started. It's yes, I was, uh, I was in the poetry community for two decades and then I sort of segued into performance art and then I finally made my way into playwriting. So yeah, it's been a journey. So to trace back this journey a little bit, of course, the two questions are, what, what was it like growing up in Pico Union? Or the advanced way of this question is, how does a gay Chicano kid from Pico Union go on to win a MacArthur's Genius Award? So <laughs> however you want to lay that out of your journey. Well, I should say the very rich part of Pico Union. <laughs> <laughs> Hardly. <laughs> or of Malibu, the rich of Pico Union. Okay. <laughs> so I was raised in a very poor family of migrant farm workers. Uh, my family's from Central California, Delano, California. And so um, growing up in downtown Los Angeles was uh, maybe one of the, the hardest and most difficult things to do because we were in a neighborhood that was very, very violent. And in the 1970s, it was the only neighborhood in Los Angeles that had two gangs occupying the same territory. So you can only imagine the craziness that was going on in terms of gunshots and fights and all of that. But I was, uh, I was uh, raised in a very religious family. So my mother is Pentecostal and apostolic religion. My father was very Catholic. So I was always in a church service somewhere, or I was doing that crazy thing of the 1970s where, you know, I was the usher at the mortuary. I went down to the hospital to help older people, you know, eat. I did everything, right? So um, I think in a way, I, I accumulated a lot of story in Pico Union, right? Uh, Pico Union was just a great place to have a lot of events. <laughs> and so those events really started to pay off later because I'd always been a, a child who journaled. I did a lot of journaling when I was a kid. And, um, and I think that was really the way that I, I always think of myself as a, a writer, even very, very young. But I was really just trying to tell the story of what it meant to be there then. Not realizing, of course, what I was writing was very political and, you know, writing about culture and community and Chicanoness and all that. But, you know, I was just trying to write to survive. I was trying to sort of figure out how writing might be not the escape so much, but how writing might be the, the way that I could um, create an avenue towards something else. You know, I didn't know what the something else was, but I, I would read a lot. And so I knew that writers traveled <laughs> and, and that was very exciting to me 
<laughs> other than a Greyhound bus downtown LA, right? So how could I travel and not have to go to Fifth and Los Angeles Street to do it? But how could I travel really like a writer traveled? You know, so yeah, I remember um, the first one of my, you know, I was one of those kids where I, we were very involved in something called the Catholic Worker, which is, uh, you know, this wonderful, uh, uh, you know, political group. And they gave me a book called The Long Loneliness by Dorothy Day. And, you know, I was, it was just the right book to get around 10 years old, right? Because it was about, you know, this rich socialite who gives up all her money to open these Catholic worker soup kitchens, right? And I thought, oh, yes, a fur. <laughs> Ridiculous, right? <laughs> so, okay, so speaking of travel, that's a... It's not quite the segue, but let's talk about Greek drama and Greek tragedy for a moment, you know, as per your book, the Greek trilogy of Luis Alfaro. So can you connect the dots to for our audience of what Greek Sophocles has to do with Chicano culture, even the Aztecs? Can you connect that? People. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, when I was growing up, we had this thing called the mythos, the myths, right? And we have them in our culture, we have them in every culture. And when I was young, you know, it was um, these mythos, these myths that kind of kept you going because they were bigger than you, they were larger than life stories. But when I started to work, I'm a, I should say that I'm a really a community-based artist. So I do, I write and I make art, but I really do it in communities. So I do a lot of stuff in jails and prisons and, you know, with a lot of uh, captive audiences, let me say, right? And um, so uh, one of the first things I did was work with these young girls in, a, um, in Arizona in a teen felon program with these young poets who were in for very serious crime. And one of the crime, I met a young lady who was 13 who had murdered her mother. And she had murdered her mother uh, because the mother had put a hit out on the dad who was a drug dealer from the south side of Tucson, Arizona. And I was so mortified. And that night, just by accident, I went into a little bookstore at the Arizona Theater Company and they had uh, 10 Greeks for $10, dollar a Greek, pretty good, right? <laughs> Election. And the first play I read was Electra, the story of a young girl who murders her mother to avenge her father's death. What? Right? Like in some strange sort of extraordinary way. Here's a play that is so old and, and through time and I, we're still suffering through the same themes of these plays, right? We're still as humans uh, wrestling with revenge and resentment and forgiveness and lust and you know, everything. So I, I just decided I was going to adapt it to a modern setting and see if I could do that. And, you know, sure enough, you know, that's what I did beat per beat, just to, to adapt it. And it was a play called Electricidad. Uh, and that was an adaptation of Electra. And I've now done, you know, three others. But it's been a really interesting journey because I, I feel like the, the timeless themes, right, that keep sort of wrestling around circling through our culture, through time, uh, continue to be the same story that we need to hear as a people. And every time, you know, I go see a production of one of my plays, it always surprises me that moment when Oedipus realizes that that is his mother, there are a whole generation in the audience who go, <laughs> and you go, you they haven't read the Greeks, right? And then just recently, you know, I was off Broadway at the public theater with the Medea, and you know, there's a moment at the end of the Medea, and this woman comes up to me in the audience and she says, Oh my god, how did you think up that ending? And I was like, Well, it's a play that's been around, right? But but so I think that they are as current as as we need them to be, right? And my job is just to, you know, unpack it or make it as real for a contemporary audience as we can make them, right? Right, and I guess on that, there, there, here's our two kind of related questions, maybe it's the same or different one. I mean, I think that you do so much uh, teaching and mentoring in the com community as well, uh, aside from all, all of your writing. I, I guess my two questions would be, what do you feel compelled or passionate about telling the next generation of of young writers of color, which is a journey, and it's also, you know, just in terms of your particular journey, and what, what do you think theater needs to move forward, you know, into the future? Um, it, you know, it, it, we, we have regular kind of regional theater, the Christmas mm -hmm. Carol, we always like joke, like, what does it need, what do you feel it, it gives vitality for theater in the future? 
Well, you know, just by a, a, a chance accident in the, in the early 90s, I met my mentor, a woman named Marie Irene Fornes, who was a very famous uh, Cuban uh, playwright who took me in, and she really mentored me through the playwriting world. I had always felt like writing was, um, was good, but it was not my passion, let's say. I was more interested in uh, trying to tell stories, and I didn't know how to tell stories. And it was only until I hit playwriting that I figured the alchemy of writing really was in character and dialogue and drama. And I found my niche as a writer, I should say. And, um, I, and Irene used to say something very interesting to me. She said, um, there were many great artists before you, and there will be many great artists after you. Your only job right now is to tell the story of today. So that really keyed into my politics, my identity, the way I want to move through the world, the way I mentor, the way I work with young people, just tell the story of today. Because if you tell the story of today, you start to understand that there are many different ways of telling a story. We haven't heard certain voices in our culture, right? And the way that very young voices work right now is completely new form. So um, my job is to, uh, post-pandemic, as we're all doing this work, and I'm doing it a lot right now, um, is to uh, imagine a world that we don't come back to the same kind of play. We come back to the theater because we always will um, always have storytelling, right? We'll always have this desire to hear stories, to see ourselves on stage. But I, I love the idea that we might reinvent how uh, we hear a story. And that's exciting because I don't think that there are a lot of writers yet we've heard. And that, it gets me excited about culture, it gets me excited about gender, it gets me excited about community. And so, you know, that, that is the work I do. That's the, that's the base of how I write. The base of how I write is to discover a new voice, right? Always with myself. How do I not repeat the same story? How do I always write in a new voice, in a new character, with a new rhythm, right? It's almost, I'm, I sound like I'm bipolar, but I think... <laughs> <laughs> but I think we kind of have to do that a little bit, right? That we have to sort of embrace the voices in our head and then allow them. You know, I, I always do this moment in my class where I say, just get out of the way of your own writing. You know, we always hear that, right? I always get out of the way of my own writing and just let characters speak. And sometimes they take on accents and they wear different outfits and they do a lot of different things. My only responsibility is to their authentic authenticity, to their voice, right? And I know that it's all shooting out of me, but I think it, what's shooting out of me is the map that I carry with me, right? The map that I carry of not only a place called Pico Union, but every place I've been to since then. And that's what makes me excited about politics. That's what gets me excited about how we listen to stories now, how we can hear somebody speak and, um, and not ever hear that story of love in the same way, right? It's, it's incredible. That is it is so incredible and so inspiring, um, Luis. Um, thank you. We could, again, we could do this for hours. Amazing. Um, Luis's new book coming out um, right in September from Methuen, the Greek trilogy of Luis Alfaro. You can read it. Pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Um, our final guest today is Viet Tong Nguyen. Hard to do a 30 second download again, but we'll try. Um, Viet Tong Nguyen's debut novel, The Sympathizer, was a New York Times bestseller and winner of the 2016 Pulitzer Prize. Not bad for a first novel. His other critically acclaimed books include Nothing Ever Dies, Vietnam and the Memory of War and Race and Resistance, Literature and Politics in Asian America, and The Refugees, a best-selling short story collection, and Chicken of the Sea, a children's book written with his six-year-old son, Ellison. He is a professor of English, American Studies, and Ethnicity and Comparative Literature at USC, another USC professor, New York Times contributing opinion editor, and, oh, another MacArthur Genius Award winner. His newest novel, The Committed, will be published in March 2021, at which time we hope he gets an actual book tour. Welcome, <laughs> welcome, Viet. Hello. Hi, Sandra. So glad to be here with you, Luis and Susan. I know what a what a lineup. It's 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 such a great conversation. Um, so we start with some background. You've described yourself as made in America but born in Vietnam. Can you tell the viewers what you mean by that? 
Well, I mean, I was factually born in Vietnam, and then I came as a refugee to the United States when I was four years old. So I grew up here, which means I was basically made here. But I, I stress both parts of that, because even though I have no real memories of the Vietnam that I was born in, there's been some kind of psychic connection that ties me to that country, to that history, to those people. And for a lot of us who were refugees, even if we've settled into our new lives and become citizens and become Americans and all of that, I think the legacy of where we came from and, and that kind of a history of war and colonialism and the refugee experience continues to haunt us. And yet at the same time, there's no doubt that I'm an American, you know, I was made here. I, the, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a writer in, in English and I express myself in a very American way as other Vietnamese people will like to remind me when they tell me that I'm not really that Vietnamese anymore. Uh, so it's a kind of this, uh, it's a very productive uh, binary that I'm in, but also there's a lot of tension there as well. And if you're a writer, it's, it's good to be in a state of tension or lack of resolution or to feel uncomfortable. These are things that I think a lot of normal, sane people don't want to feel. But for a writer, at least for a writer like me, it's good to feel unease because this is where a lot of the creative energy comes from. Um, so before we go and talk about your, the sympathizer, um, I, I, I'm fascinated because for a novelist, you have a slightly unusual trajectory. So in the 90s, you go to college at UC Riverside, UCLA, end up at UC Berkeley, get your PhD at Berkeley in 1997, and then you go, are, uh, join the faculty of USC in 1997. Then almost 20 years later, you publish The Sympathizer, which of course, like, so, so that's for, it's interesting. So how were you fomenting in those years? How does an academic turn to like, say, I'm a very successful academic, I'm going to write a novel, and it's an amazing novel. How, what were you, were you fomenting in those years? What? Well, I just, I just blame it all on my parents. You know, my parents are very devout, hardworking Catholic people. <laughs> all they did was work all the time, you know, and sacrifice their lives so that I could have a life in the United States. So it, it, was, it was impossible for me to imagine going home to my parents and saying, hey, mom and dad, I want to be a writer. It just would make no sense to them at all. And they were actually relatively liberal in the sense that when I came home and I said, well, you know, I want to get a doctorate in English, they did not freak out. <laughs> they said, okay, you can get a doctorate in English because at least there's the word doctor in there. <laughs> you know, my, my brother, my older brother was already a medical doctor. So I thought this might be sort of something in a similar vein. So for me to become an academic, to get a doctorate, to become a professor, these were all sort of respectable career options. And I was grateful that my parents were willing to accept that versus forcing me to become a medical doctor or a lawyer or an engineer. So it was my day job to become a doctor. But when I was uh, entering graduate school, I heard of something called tenure. You know, and tenure is this incredible privilege where if you get it, you, don't, you can't get fired. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna become a professor, get tenure, and then I can't be fired. I'm just gonna become, I'm just, I'm gonna become a writer at that point. So that was my long-term career plan. And I thought, okay, I'll get tenure. And then writing a book can't be that hard. I'm gonna write a book of short stories. They're short, shouldn't take too long. It should just take a couple of years. And in fact, uh, it, it took, I think, a dozen years after I got tenure or longer before I finished that short story collection and I finished The Sympathizer and that, that book was published. So it was actually quite, quite a, lo a long and difficult road for me uh, to do, but it was sort of an accident that I became a writer second versus being a writer first. So one more writerly question. I, I can't resist as, as a dropout of the USC English department in graduate school in like 1989. Um, so it seems though that fiction writing and academic writing are really are really quite different, or at least they would have been there then. Of kind of of and your fiction is fantastic. It's page turning. It's delicious. It, it is like do you when you write do you go into a different place when you write your fiction as opposed to your more nonfiction work? And what do you think you can accomplish in fiction that, that nonfiction can't accomplish? Well, I think there are really two very different kinds of languages. And if you spend your life acquiring one language, whether it's fiction or, or, or academic writing, it's very difficult to shift into another language because you've sacrificed so much to become fluent in this one language. And then you have to decide that you're going to become not fluent in another language. It's a very humbling experience. So that's why I think it's not very common to see people 
doing both. And for people who speak these two different languages to look at each other with a certain kind of skepticism. So when I started writing fiction, I didn't really talk about it that much. You know, I, th I thought that would be kind of obnoxious if I went around saying, I'm, I'm going to be a writer. But it leaked out. And I think my academic colleagues, my scholarly colleagues sort of patted me on the head and thought, well, yeah, it's gonna, you know, as a sort of hobby, uh, wanting to become a writer, and we had the real writers here in the department, you know. Um, but I took it very seriously, and I think that what, one thing that fiction does that is much harder to do in academic writing, or even some kinds of nonfiction writing is, we tell stories. Now, it would be great if academics could tell stories. Anybody who has any experience with academics know they're very bad at telling stories with their scholarship, but we tell stories in, in fiction writing. It's a very basic thing. But another thing that I discovered that I really didn't anticipate, I mean, I, I understood it rationally, but I didn't understand it as a practice, is that to be a writer of fiction, you have to access your emotions, your feelings. Uh, this, this is how, if, if we want to move the reader, we have to be able to move ourselves too. And I came from this very repressed background, okay, of being a Vietnamese Catholic, that's very repressive. And then I became an academic that's very repressive. There you're supposed to just be objective and you know, work with your ideas. There's, no, there's not supposed to be any emotions involved here. So in order for me to become a writer, I had to learn how to shrug off all of this repression, this intellectual repression, this spiritual repression, to try to feel something inside of myself. That's a, that was very, very hard for me to do. And it's something that I'm still trying to learn uh, even now. But I think that's absolutely really, really crucial. Um, that the, the, the fiction is, a lot of it is about obviously various kinds of artistic issues, technical issues and so on. But a considerable amount of fiction is being able to drill into a part of yourself that you don't want to see, that other people may not want to see. And again, normal sane people don't want to do this kind of stuff. But I think as a fiction writer, you do have to go where it hurts. Okay, so pivoting to the sympathizer as a text, a reviewer has described, and many of, of, of the critical praise um, of this book as giving voice to the previously voiceless, like animating the Vietnamese perspective in a new way. So if you could just lay out for our audience what you think is the, is the traditional received story about Vietnamese people or the Vietnam War and how you dug into that to, to change it and tell another story. First of all, let me say, I am not a voice for the voiceless. If you have ever <laughs> met any Vietnamese people, been to a Vietnamese restaurant, visited a Vietnamese house, you know we're very, very loud. So it's not that we're voiceless, it's that we're not heard. And this is a condition we share with all kinds of minoritized and marginalized populations here and elsewhere. People are not voiceless. They're telling stories all the time. But a society like this one is structurally constructed to silence us, to not hear us, to not want to have our stories, unless someone is lucky enough to come along and become the voice for the voiceless. And the reason why we use this stupid term is because if you're from dominant society, you don't want to hear from a million Vietnamese people. You want to hear from one Vietnamese person because it's easier to deal with. You can reward that person, elevate that person, and not have to deal with the remaining one million minus one Vietnamese people. Okay, so it's a very common dynamic in this country, and I go around saying all the time, I'm very lucky to <laughs> have become a so-called voice for the voiceless, but I reject that label all the time. And it's related to how it is that the United States understands Vietnam and the Vietnam War, and needless to say, how the United States and dominant society understands any kind of minority, the United States and dominant American society only wants to hear one story, given a history. And when it comes to the Vietnam War, Americans want to hear only their own story. And when they hear stories from Vietnamese people, what they want to hear is, thank you. Thank you for rescuing us from communism. What Americans don't want to hear is, well, you bombed our country in the first place. You forced us to fight this war on your terms. And maybe we wouldn't need to be rescued if Americans hadn't been there. Most Americans don't like hearing this. And so in The Sympathizer, that's what I wanted to do. Now, I'd read a whole bunch of American books about the war. I'd seen almost every movie that Hollywood made about the war, an exercise I recommend to nobody. And I said, I'm not going to be the Vietnamese American writer that writes a book to placate American people. 
because that's what American people want. And that's not what a writer is supposed to do. A writer is supposed to tell the truth, even if the truth hurts the writer and hurts the reader. And so the sympathizer tells the history of the war and its aftermath, the refugee experience, from my perspective. And one of the things that Susan said is very important, which is that wars in the American imagination are perceived to be the experiences of men, of soldiers, and particularly of white men. And that is true for the American war in Vietnam. And so what's crucial to recognize is that while 58,000 American soldiers died in the Vietnam War, which is a tragedy, 3 million Vietnamese people died, and most of them were not soldiers. Most of them were civilians, and a lot of them were women, and a lot of them were children. And the war didn't stop in 1975. The war continued afterwards for the Vietnamese people through all kinds of terrible things, such as re-education camps and the refugee experience. So the sympathizer takes up all of these things and tells that story, which most Americans don't know anything about. And, you know, and speaking of Vietnam War stories told in America, uh, it, you know, it's so interesting, we're such a fascinating time that kind of the most recent Vietnam War movie of memory is Spike Lee's The Five Bloods, um, which of course has black men at its center. Um, and you, did, you wrote such a brilliant piece and I think it's hilarious because the voice of the voiceless quote came from the New York Times review. So we'll go back to the New York Times. Um, that you wrote an amazing uh, ed piece just looking at it, just giving another perspective. Can you, can you tell the audience what, what yeah. that is? And in fact, I also, before I wrote that New York Times piece, live tweeted my reactions to the five bloods, which you can see in your Twitter feed, I warn you. I'm sorry, you can see in the chat, I warn you. If you're sensitive, don't read it because there are a lot of plot spoilers and a lot of obscenities as I live tweeted my response to The Five Bloods. Because when I heard that Spike Lee was doing The Five Bloods, I thought, wow, I really admire Spike Lee. I love a lot of his movies, but I, I am filled with a sense of dread about what this movie is gonna be like when it depicts Vietnamese people. And in fact, it's a horrible movie when it comes to depicting Vietnamese people. It's not as racist as a lot of American war movies because it doesn't depict Vietnamese people as the yellow peril, but it does depict Vietnamese people as the sidekick, the whore, the bastard child, all these other kinds of stereotypes that are out there. And so what The Five Bloods does, I think, is that it, it's, it's a very important movie in that it's centering black male experience and it is centering an anti-racist critique, which we expect from Spike Lee. But at the same time, it cannot get over this dominant American perspective that says we got to look at the world from an American point of view and everybody else is subordinated to that to service the American imagination. And unfortunately, I do expect more from a politically conscious black director, director like Spike Lee than I would expect from a white director. I think Spike Lee should have done better, should have known better. And I think the fact that he did not have a good grasp on how he was representing Vietnamese people impacted how he thought about the black male experience in Vietnam. And I, I think one, two more questions, one short question, one I'm gonna ask you about your, tell us about your new book is, uh, we had an audience question about thinking, about wondering if coronavirus changes the voice of Asian Americans in the arts or, and, and I think that we're, we're in such a big national moment that, that sort of for Asian American artists to think about how they, uh, th how their narrative is being reflected is something you've, I think you've thought about also. Unfortunately, I'm an op-ed writer. So when things piss me off, I'm like, I gotta write an op-ed about this, you know? So I wrote a 5,000 word piece for Time Magazine, which I just put into the chat, about Asian Americans as the model minority in the time of coronavirus. You know, we've been, lulled, many of us, not all of us, but many Asian Americans have been lulled into this sense of false security over the past couple of decades that we've done everything that American society has asked us to do. We've worked hard, we've studied hard, we've been quiet, we've been obedient, we haven't, been, we haven't complained too much when we hit the glass ceiling, and now you're gonna call this the Kung Flu and the Chinese virus? Right. And you're gonna spit on us in the street? Right. You know, it's, it's, it's completely racist, and it's coming from the top of this country, and it's circulating all the way to the bottom, and it reveals that this country has a very deep strain of anti-Asian virus, that goes back to the 19th century and that it's a part of the fact that this country is kind of racist overall to a whole lot of people. So it's just our turn at this moment. And it's absolutely urgent for Asian Americans not to take this lying down, not to be quiet, but to speak up, to fight back and to connect the dots. That it's not just about us, but that it's just our turn. You know, the Trump administration started 
uh, by calling out Latinos as rapists and invaders and as carriers of disease and drugs. And then they turned to Muslims and then they turned to African Americans and black people. And now it's Asian Americans turn. It's extremely systematic. It's not just our problem. We have to fight in solidarity against all these kinds of racisms. So finally, can you tell us a bit about your book, The Committed, that is coming out in March? Well, with The Sympathizer, I set out to offend everybody. Yay! And, yes. <laughs> and strangely enough, I got the Pulitzer Prize. I just, I don't, I don't understand how that happened. But in The Committed, I set out to offend French people. So all those Americans who were upset with me about The Sympathizer telling me to go back to Vietnam, love it or leave it, and so on. Well, just read The Committed. I know all these Americans who don't like what I had to say in The Sympathizer, probably don't like the French either. So in The Committed, it takes place in the early 1980s in uh, Paris, and it takes on French racism, French colonialism, with the same spirit of The Sympathizer. Yeah, and it sounds fantastic. Yeah, it sounds fantastic. And it, yes, and the follow up. And what, will there be a movie made of the uh, We're in very protracted negotiations over TV, so we'll see. Yes. Oh, yes. No, fantastic. Well, um, and, and, and I, I guess as you're teaching, my final question to you, teaching at U, USC, is there, what wisdom do you give your students who are you know, struggling with it, well, issues of writing, literature, et cetera, of the next generation of young people. Do you have a wish for them, a lesson for them, something you want to impart to them? I, I just tell them to know what they're passionate about and to know that they have to find the voice that they really want to speak with and speak through. Um, this is very basic advice, you know, but I was a very passionate 21 year old and I don't want to be 21 years old again and to repeat the same mistakes and be the same kind of flawed person I was at 21 but I want to have the passion that I had at 21 that's really really crucial and I'm still pursuing the same road that I thought I was going to pursue at 21 and that's so absolutely crucial to know who you are what you believe in and to follow through with that whether it's going to be in your scholarship or whether it's going to be in your your writing whether it's in, in your vision of yourself as an artist to have a sense of conviction and to try to find out what that, that very passionate voice is. Thank you. And, and then maybe your first novel could also be a Pulitzer Prize winner if you follow Viet's advice. Thank you so much. Um, Viet's new book coming out in March is going to be The Committed. Um, and it is the sequel to The Sympathizer. And, it's, and, and you can pre-order right away. So thank you so much. To you, Samantha Dunn. Yes, thank you. We had a bit just popped off, but we had a burning question. People were asking what the heck was on his shirt. We oh, okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's the narrative plenitude, stupid. And uh, a fan actually just came up to me at an event and gave me this t-shirt. It's based on an op-ed I wrote for the New York Times where I said, we need narrative plenitude. If you're a minority, you know that you exist in narrative scarcity. Almost none of the stories are about you. So when a story about you comes out, you just, you know, you're so excited, like, like with Crazy Rich Asians. We're like, oh my God, there's a movie about us. Too bad it's a bad movie. But, you know, yeah, okay, so but you can't say that because there's only one movie about you. So you know you're in the majority when you have narrative plenitude, when almost all the stories are about you. And so if one movie is bad, you don't care because you have, you know, a thousand others. And so that's what we need to work for is narrative plenitude for everybody. Thank and you. That is, that is not a shy agent that we just talked with right there. That is not, that is not an obedient shy agent or a quiet agent. So Thank you, Sandra. Narrative plenitude it is. All right. Wow. What a night. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, my sister, for, for this evening. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, we are at the, uh, at the top of our show. Um, I just wanted to say next week, oh, thank you, Julie, for you've already got it. Next week is, please join us for Kidding Around, celebrating the YA audience. And that is with uh, the blockbuster best-selling author, Jeff Kinney of Diary of a Wimpy Kid, uh, Phineas and Ferb co-creator, Dan Povenmeyer, and author Lilium Rivera. See you next week, and thanks for this week. We appreciate you. <laughs>